Good morning, uh, friends. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant in anesthesia working in uh, Liverpool, UK. And today I'm going to talk about airborne infection isolation. And, and this I'm going to talk uh, especially in, in relation to the operation rooms or the operation theaters. Uh, before we start off uh, uh, about uh, the uh, isolation or containment of infection, uh, it's important for us to understand a few facts about corona. Now, the studies from uh, China and Italy actually have shown that 43% uh, of the patient acquire infection within the hospital setting. And that means hospitals are actually the source of infection for almost 43% of the patients acquiring this infection. It is also important to understand that screening alone is not sufficient because transmission can occur during the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic phase of this infection. So you can actually have patients who or people who are walking uh, you know, without any symptoms and still be transmitting uh, this infection. And it has been shown that uh, even people who actually have infection, say of the 100 people, uh, 10 people are actually enough uh, to transmit infection to 80% of the people. Now, uh, if we uh, look at the uh, viral RNA uh, levels um, from the upper respiratory specimen, and uh, they appear to be higher soon after symptoms onset uh, compared with the late, uh, later part of the illness. So it is the early part of the illness uh, where and uh, the there is uh, the patients are largely infective. So, like I've already said, a patient uh, can still be uh, you know infective in the pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic phase of this illness. And uh, in patients uh, with mild COVID-19 infectious uh, viruses were isolated from the upper respiratory tract and uh, sputum specimens during the first eight days of the illness. Uh, but not after uh, this interval, despite continued high viral levels at these sites. Uh, so it is, it is the first eight days of illness, uh, which are very, very important. And this is uh, when uh, most uh, patients can transmit uh, the infection. The common, common symptoms of uh, the COVID, as we know, is fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, running nerves is not a symptom of uh, COVID. And uh, there has also been seen that CNS symptoms may also be present. As so, uh, you know, the loss of uh, the smell and taste are uh, considered to be early signs. And uh, sometimes dizziness uh, from uh, if uh, the, uh, you know, cranial nerves getting affected. Uh, it can also be symptoms of uh, COVID. So it is uh, important that uh, to identify and uh, contain uh, the potentially infectious patients uh, that a timely uh, response is taken uh, for that. So there is uh, a hierarchy of control measures uh, to uh, uh, contain uh, the infection uh, in the system. And uh, there are uh, three uh, steps in this involved. Uh, the first one is the administrative or work practice controls. Uh, second is the environmental control. And third is the uh, personal protective equipment. So these are important to reduce the risk of exposure uh, to the airborne infectious disease agents. From and uh, this is important to uh, prim uh, you know, uh, get the uninfected people or protect the uninfected people. And uh, the, um, the airborne infection isolation rooms and hospital system uh, must be uh, monitored continuously uh, for these protective measures. The, in uh, the administrative work practice controls uh, usually involves uh, uh, you know, uh, deciding where you're going to perform the aerosol generating procedures, uh, make sure how we don't actually uh, spread the infection uh, when we are uh, doing these procedures, um, making sure that the doors of the uh, aerosol infection isolation rooms are closed at all times, there is no leaks within them, uh, make sure that people actually follow hand hygiene, 
and there are signs everywhere uh, to uh, follow these practices. So basically these are written policies and protocol to ensure rapid identification, isolation, and diagnostic evaluation and treatment of people or persons who have actually acquired this infection. The environmental controls are very important and this uh, uh, involve physical and uh, mechanical measure used to reduce the risk of transmission of the uh, infection uh, where using the ensuring that the ventilation filtration uh, system is working well the uh, local exhaust ventilation devices are uh, fit and are properly working uh, use of adjuvant uh, methods of uh, uh, use of disinfection like ultraviolet germicidal radiation of these rooms and uh, the third is the uh, pr uh, personal protective equipment which everybody actually knows uh, about this is something which will be worn by the healthcare workers and use uh, to reduce the exposure to communicable diseases this involves gowns gloves mask respirators eye uh, protection and i will discuss this actually earlier than uh, what the environmental control actually means so like i said the administrative control is all about uh, you know uh, doing the all your uh, paperwork putting signs making sure everybody follows hand hygiene and uh, that can be done uh, by the administrators uh, sitting in the room uh, now the other important thing which everybody uh, you know keeps talking about is a personal protective equipment and what exactly these involve? So these can be a good surgical mask. And now uh, this we are talking about is type 2R uh, uh, surgical mask. And these are multiply. Now, and these, these could be three ply or five ply uh, or three layer or five layer, uh, the surgical mask. And these are fluid resistant. So when you actually have a splash uh, on them, they does not actually absorb them. So that is very, very important part. Of the surgical mask and they do actually contain filtration uh, uh, you know uh, layers uh, within within the mask where the simple surgical mask these can they may not be actually uh, fluid resistant they may absorb the you know your droplets so these are not not the safe ones these are okay for people to wear when you are actually outside uh, uh, in a non-infected uh, kind of environment Next is the uh, FFP3 and uh, face shields. Uh, uh, so this is very, very important to not only cover your, uh, you know, breathing apparatus, so the nose and mouth, uh, but also cover the rest of the face and uh, with a face shield. And the face shield should at least extend from the forehead uh, to below the chin, and it should be all wrapped around. So it's very important that the whole of the face is covered all around. So it's just a good wrap around. Uh, this will not only protect your eyes, but they will also protect uh, you, your face mask as well. Uh, some people do use uh, goggles. In that case, you uh, need to actually uh, make sure that your your face mask are not soiled uh, during the protection or they are all single use. The gowns uh, need to be uh, either disposable fluid resistant gowns or you can actually use uh, the hazmat suits. Uh, which actually cover you from uh, head to toe. Uh, when you're using the disposal for fluid resistant gowns, it's important that uh, you also use shoe covers to so make sure your shoe are also protected from the spillage and from droplets. You can also use uh, plastic aprons over your gowns, uh, a disposable gowns, and uh, you know this allows you to use your gowns for extended period of time. So coming to what kind of, uh, you know, what parts of the PE do you need, PPE do you need for various procedures? So we'll go through them uh, one by one. Uh, so when you are performing a aerosol generating procedure on a possible or confirmed case, uh, this uh, can be any setting outside a high risk area, acute care area. So obviously you need to protect your eye and face. So you're going to use a a uh, filtering paste uh, uh, face piece respirator so you're going to use a mask a ffp3 mask or a respirator you're going to use a disposable fluid resistant gown or a hazmat suit 
you're going to use a disposable glove and if you're not using a hazmat suit you will also use uh, your uh, shoe covers so now these are because these uh, is a aerosol generating procedure where uh, there is going to be lots of droplets and aerosol uh, you need to actually use a uh, single uh, use items in these cases uh, if you want to uh, protect yourself and protect environment and protect other people now if you're working in a high risk acute area uh, with possible or confirmed cases now you use everything and uh, what has been used for aerosol genetic procedures so you are going to use AI uh, face protection okay these can be for sessional use uh, you can use the filter face uh, piece respirator or ffp3 and this again can be for the whole of your session and uh, you do use a disposal fluid resistant gown again this can be for sessional uh, use and obviously disposable graphs which will change for each case but what is all added to this is a disposable plastic apron which you can wear over your disposal resistant gown so after every case you can dispose of your gloves along with your your a plastic apron and this allows you to actually use the whole ppe for a whole session of uh, whatever eight hours or 12 hours you're going to actually be working in the high recircute area uh, this prevents the cross contamination between uh, different areas so you're not moving around your uh, clean uh, within one area and uh, this is considered to be a better practice now if you're working in an inpatient maternity uh, radiology area with possible or confirmed cases uh, with uh, direct patient care that you you would come within two meters of the patient in that case you actually use a eye of face protection and um, in this case you can use just a fluid resistant type 2 surgical mask um, you don't uh, actually need that uh, uh, but I will still suggest that uh, you use a, a um, you know face shield along uh, with your uh, flu resistance mask okay. so you do actually cover your face eye face and eye protection or goggles uh, along with the surgical mask um, you can use uh, disposable gloves and you can actually use uh, a, um, a plastic aprons can be can be used for these uh, these cases um, Now, if you're working in a patient area with possible or confirmed cases, but you're not going to come in close contact with the patient. In that case, I think most important thing is to actually uh, use just a, uh, a face shield uh, and, and the fluid resistant surgical mask along with the gloves, wherever it is, uh, you need to actually uh, touch the surfaces because the surfaces can still be there. So use your common sense, uh, basically. If you're working in an emergency department, uh, acute assessment area with possible uh, or confirmed cases, and you're going to be uh, within direct, within the two meters, uh, then uh, you need to uh, use a fluid resistance type two surgical mask, uh, protect your eyes and face uh, with a face shield, um, and uh, you actually use disposable plastic aprons and disposable gloves or hazmat suits. So, uh, in case of when you are actually going to transfer pac uh, patients and um, uh, possible confirmed cases, you're going to be with close close contact with the patient within two meters. Uh, so, in that case, you need to use uh, the uh, eye and face protection, uh, fluid resistant mask, uh, disposable uh, fluid resistant gowns. A disposable gloves and make sure that you also have the uh, shoe covers on if you're not doing the next important thing is is operating at uh, theaters with possible or confirmed cases uh, but in there's no uh, aerosol generating procedures being done now in these cases because uh, the uh, main thing is that they might be droplets but they know no, no uh, aerosol generating uh, procedure uh, you can actually instead of using your uh, FFP3 respirator, uh, a fluid resistant type 2 surgical mask um, with eye protection is good enough. And obviously, you will actually use a 
or fluid resistant gown and uh, disposable gloves and uh, shoe covers. Now, if you are actually working in a labor war and, and this is actually going to have a second or third stage labor, uh, vaginal deliveries, uh, uh, no aerosol genetic procedure uh, possible confirmed, and this is a possible confirmed cases. Now, you have to actually remember that uh, when the patients are actually in labor and uh, they are actually pushing, they will actually generate aerosol. Uh, so it is important that you still protect your face and eyes and, uh, uh, and have a fluid uh, resistance type to surgical mask at least um, in these cases. Uh, you may not come in in, uh, in a condo within two meters, so you may be away from, uh, the more than two meters away from uh, patients. Uh, obviously, the uh, gynecologist uh, might be nearer to these patients, uh, so they would actually require more protection than you would. Um, but uh, use all the precautions, uh, use uh, fluid race and surgical mask, use your face uh, protection um, and disposable plastic wrist and gowns and disposable gloves. Okay. Uh, so these, these are actually important. <clears throat> now uh, coming to the environmental controls and um, so this is the most difficult part uh, for people to understand. So uh, this environmental control uh, involves uh, pressure ma ma management uh, for appropriate airflow within the uh, rooms or the theaters. You're looking at uh, the uh, air changes for dilution or ventilation, and uh, you're looking at the filtration system for removing the infectious particles. Now, most theaters are positive pressure uh, ventilated, so there is positive pressure within theaters. The air from the theater actually moves out into the corridors or into the environment. So in this case, you are actually spreading the infection. So you, if you are actually performing an aerosol generating procedure, the infection is going to spread across into the corridor and infect the people. So this is not the best kind of system you actually want to have. So positive pressure ventilation system is actually not. But if you actually have a negative pressure theater, the fresh air actually moves in. It actually not only uh, contains the infection within the operation theater, but it also actually dilutes the infection. So to actually uh, ensure that there's a negative pressure uh, within the operation theater, it's important to monitor the pressure. And the differential pressure between the theater and the corridor, it needs to be negative. So it needs to be negative in respect to the corridor. Um, the the room or the theater. So when you are talking about regular pressure, you are talking about the differential between the isolation uh, isolation room, uh, the operation theater or the room, and the corridor. And obviously, the corridor uh, need to be positive in respect to the uh, room, or that means that the operation room or the patient room need to be negatively pressurized. And like we said, this helps not only to prevent infection particle from escaping the room, they also dilute the infection within the rooms. Now, if the room actually uh, opens into an anti-room, then these anti-room need to be negative. In that case, the, the AIR could be negative or positive. Uh, obviously, if it is negative, that's always better. But even if it is positive, then the air is actually moving uh, from a positive uh, to a negative room. That is, the anteroom is negative, so the air will move to the anteroom. So the anteroom uh, will obviously uh, have a negative pressure, but then the room, the air is moving from corridor to anteroom because anteroom is negative. So uh, anteroom uh, becomes a infective area, uh, but then the dilution is actually happening in the anteroom rather than in the AIR. So. AR can be, the room can be either positive or negative. So because there is a differential pressure, the greater the differential pressure, greater will be the movement of air. Uh, so uh, the negative pressure has to be constantly uh, monitored. And uh, like I said, this uh, movement of clean air not only lead to containment of infectious particles within that room, uh, but it also dilutes the infectious particles. So differential pressure is basically uh, the uh, a 
differential between the supply and the exhaust. And if you need to create a negative pressure, then the mechanically exhaust air need to be greater than a mechanically supplied air. Okay. Uh, but there is always leaks. There is nothing called a perfectly sealed uh, you know, room. And uh, the leaks can occur around the doors, um, around the other areas. Um, so uh, these needs to be, leaks should be prevented. I mean, they should be minimal. Uh, so that uh, there is no um, movement of air from the other areas. So what is this uh, differential uh, we are talking about uh, between the, uh, you know, the exhaust and the supply? So the minimal required uh, differential pressure is 0 0.01 inch of water gauge, uh, which equates to around 2.5 pascals. So that's what we're going to talk about in, in pascals here. So we need around... Uh, 2.5 pascals of difference uh, between the corridor and the rooms, uh, whether it's the, or the operation theater room or the room where the patient is going to be managed uh, later on. The other important thing uh, we need to know is the number of air changes per hour which are happening within the operation theater. And um, if we actually look at the time required to remove, uh, you know, 99% of the airborne particles, uh, so uh, most uh, the theaters will actually have uh, around 20 air changes and uh, per hour. And uh, if you look at that to actually achieve 99% efficiency, that 99% of the particles are actually, you know, diluted or almost removed, uh, you need around 21 minutes. And that's where comes the time of this that, oh, you need to wait 20 minutes after a aerosol genetic procedure has been performed within the operation theater. Now this is this is actually based on the fact that the air changes are actually happening very efficiently and you actually have a very good filtration system. Uh, but if you actually don't, your filtration system is not effective, then it can actually take much longer uh, to have that efficient uh, removal of the particles. And so if you actually have uh, more number of uh, changes, air changes per hour, uh, you can actually reduce uh, the uh, numbers. And uh, so when you're looking at, uh, you know, the laminar flow, that, there the uh, number of changes are huge. They can be as much as 150 changes per, per hour. Uh, but the most, uh, you know, the uh, ventilation system in most theaters is, is a turbulent mixing of air flows. Uh, these are not laminar flows. So where you're using an air conditioning system, there is turbulence uh, in this system. So this these uh, leads to more mixing uh, of the particles. Whereas in the laminar flow, it's a vertical. Most of the time, it's a vertical. You can actually see it's around the operation uh, table, uh, just above above the operation table, and the uh, gases are vented out uh, along it. Uh, so there are HEPA filters outside. At the canopy so you have the canopy through which the uh, particles are coming in and they are being being actually sucked in uh, around uh, through the HEPA filters which need to be changed uh, and need to be tested uh, regularly uh, for their efficiency so when we're talking about uh, creating a negative pressure isolation room so you don't actually have all the other positive uh, pressure you need to actually now create a, a temporary negative pressure isolation room so this was the important part so you, anybody uh, uh, can be wearing a ppe but if you're actually not working in the negative pressure room and you actually are uh, doing a aerosol generating procedures uh, then your safety is reduced so to create a negative pressure room we need to actually have hepa filters and we need to actually have machines uh, which actually use hepa filters so portable HEPA filtration machines are actually available in the market. You can actually hire them, you can actually buy them. So uh, these are more important. The other thing we need is window adapters where this HEPA filter, uh, you know, the uh, tubes, the hose can be actually attached to. So, and another important part of the HEPA uh, filters are the pre-filters. Now these are the filters where you will actually, the, all the dust and uh, uh, all the you know big macro particles will be actually attached, and this is our very important, uh, and uh, because these can be easily changed and they can be easily washed and um, uh, put back, uh, and increase the efficiency 
of the filtration system there can be multi-layer uh, filters available which can use additional uh, methods of filtration so some could actually use a charcoal filters and some can also actually use the ultraviolet rays uh, to actually kill the, the uh, viral particles now the first part is where is uh, where uh, the uh, air has been discharged outside the room so there is no recirculation happening so in this case what do we do so uh, what we do is that uh, uh, we actually install the HEPA machine uh, HEPA filtration machine within the theater and the hose is uh, then uh, attached to a window for that it's important that the exhaust or written grills and uh, other systems are uh, completely closed and ensure that there is minimal leaks within within the system uh, so to have this you would actually need a window adapter and uh, the hose is attached to it and make sure that it's sealed all around using it uh, uh, you know the tapes and other methods once this has happened then you actually adjust the flow uh, within uh, with the thing and we ensure that the differential pressure like i've said uh, should be around 2.5 pa uh, between the corridor and the uh, the room or the operation theater room so it should be negative uh, within the theater uh, so that the air is sucked in into the system uh, rather than actually uh, you know uh, getting um, forced out so this will lead to containment of the infection now the second system is that where you actually using the uh, return or the exhaust system within the theater so in this case there is no window within the system but there is exhaust system so the HEPA machine HEPA filtration machine is actually within the theater and the uh, hose is actually attached uh, to the grill and again you need an adapter for the grill and uh, you need to seal it uh, with an insulation system and uh, adjust the flow so that the differential pressure around 2.5 pa uh, with respect to the corridor in this system it's very very important uh, that uh, the uh, amount of air which is pumped back into uh, the return air system uh, is not uh, huge and uh, that it uh, over pressurize the uh, system uh, because then this can disturb the air balance uh, within the um, you know the return exhaust air system and create a back pressure uh, which is not good for the circulation and this will upset the balance uh, uh, so it's important that you actually set the flows uh, and monitor the pressure differential uh, between the two systems uh, closely the last system is the using a a, a kind of a tent now this is not the most effective method uh, so the area around the bed is sealed off uh, using a fire rated plastic sheeting from top to bottom everywhere uh, it is need to be sealed off and the HEPA filtration machine is within the uh, tent and the air actually moves from the tent to the outside so the outside there is normal uh, your um, uh, filtration system uh, and the venting system uh, but the HEPA filtration within a tent. This is considered a lease, and this is actually not very practical because uh, movement of people is actually restricted within the tent, unlike the whole theater. So, and this is more for containing a patient in a in a ward and the ward system. So, one of the most important part of this system is that monitoring the differential pressure. So, and the for this monitors are available. Uh, which actually have two inlets uh, one inlet is left open within the theater and the other is uh, you can uh, show the tubing under the uh, uh, you know the doors uh, and it will be lying in the corridor and then you ensure that the difference is around 2.5 to do 2.5 pascals uh, within the two systems so how do you utilize this negative pressure system uh, within the theater complex so all your theaters are positive pressure but what you can do is that if you actually have two OTs or three OTs one of the theaters need to be converted to a negative pressure room so this becomes your room where you are actually going to do all the aerosol generating procedures uh, whether it's an intubation or you're doing bronchoscopic or airway uh, you know maneuvers so these are all done in this system so 
this will likely only have minimum number of stuff. They will likely have appropriate PPE don't. And they will likely create, uh, I mean, do the procedure. So the intubation is done here. Once the intubation actually is done, uh, the patient is disconnected from the machine, uh, the tubes are clamped, and the patient is then moved to the uh, operating theater. And once the patient is actually connected uh, to the machine uh, with appropriate filtration system, uh, then you actually take off the clamp and then you start the case. So uh, this doesn't require the person uh, in the uh, theaters where the operation is going to be to wait for those 20 minutes. And you're also ensuring that the, the theater remains, the operating theater actually remains clean all the time. And, and the uh, you know, exposure to the other stuff is minimal uh, in this uh, procedure. So once the patient, uh, the, the operation is done, again, <clears throat> uh, the lungs are filled with 100% oxygen, the tube is clamped, the patient is disconnected, you can actually leave the viral filter on and take the patient back to the negative pressure room and that's where the extubation will occur and that is where the patient will be recovered. Um, so the recovery staff will also be actually coming in into this room and doing that. So the next uh, part is, is protecting the machine and uh, and use of single use equipment uh, is very very important so disposable equipment uh, so if you are actually using the machine, uh, cover the machine with uh, the plastic covers uh, from top to bottom, okay, so that uh, it is not exposed to anything. If you, with the breathing uh, system, it's important to use filters, viral filters, like the expert report site, and, and use uh, the viral filters uh, for the uh, patient breathing system. So these are disposable ones. You need to actually change, change them after every case. The internal components of anesthesia machines and breathing system do not need terminal cleaning if breathing circuit filters have been used uh, as I have just explained. So you have filter, viral filter at the expiratory end of the machine and, uh, and you're also using a, a viral filters uh, for the patient end as well. The other important thing is the environmental disinfection and diluted household bleach solutions or Alcohol solution <clears throat> that have 70% alcohol are, in, are good uh, disinfectants. So to reduce the spread of COVID-19, environmental infection control procedures should be implemented. And enhance environmental cleaning and disinfection protocols for rooms, uh, especially where uh, ye, there are suspected uh, or COVID positive patients and where healthcare workers are going to be moving in and out. And now these parts need to be properly cleaned. And we can also use adjuvant uh, disinfection methods once the patient like leaves the rooms. So ultraviolet light or hydrogen peroxide vapors can also be used in addition to, uh, to the household uh, disinfectants. It's also important that the environmental service workers are appropriately trained and they actually use appropriate PPE. Uh, so they should be actually be again uh, be fit tested uh, for the mask, and they should be trained in uh, uh, you know how to disinfect the area properly. Uh, especially uh, this becomes very very important where aerosol generating procedures are going to be performed. Uh, PPE should be the same as uh, what the healthcare workers are actually using because these people are going to be exposed to a very high uh, load of viral particles. A study from Singapore actually has seen um, that uh, virus was detected on nearly all surfaces tested like handles, light switches, beds, bed rails, doors, windows, toilets, sink, well, everywhere there were actually viral particles. But once they had actually gone uh, disinfection, these viral particles were not detected at all. But it is also important to know that uh, just because viral particles have been detected, that does not mean um, that there is these are infectious uh, viruses. They may be not be actually infective at all. 
So to summarize the whole uh, lecture, you can say that airborne infection isolation uh, hierarchy of control measure include administrative control or work practices, environmental control, and proper use of the personal protective equipment. Like I have said, environmental control is a neglected area, and uh, uh, it's important uh, that in addition to the PPE, uh, this is used appropriately so if you can actually create a negative pressure room for aerosol generating procedure you will uh, contain and uh, prevent the spread of infection uh, to other people and environmental disinfection is uh, uh, important uh, to contain and prevent spread and for this is important that the people who are doing it are uh, not only they are protected as uh, the healthcare workers uh, but that they are appropriately trained as well uh, for uh, doing this procedure. And adjuvant uh, uh, disinfection, uh, you know, methods uh, like using ultraviolet rays or hydrogen peroxide vapors improves uh, the uh, disinfection procedure. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for listening to this uh, long lecture. And uh, you can actually discuss the... Uh, uh, all your doubts and uh, clear your doubts uh, later on uh, on the uh, group. Thank you.